Oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hey, I'm Blake. And I'm Dave. Oh my fucking God. (laughs) This is the worst episode of First Prize Films, the podcast where we each select a genre-specific movie separated by at least a decade and pit them against each other to find out which film wins the coveted title of First Prize. Dave, if you wouldn't jump the gun, but still tell us what that means. (laughs) Yeah, so it's like traffic cones on a road not being worked on. It's pointless. Today, we are Zach Bagginsing our way through these ghost horror movies. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> I made Blake watch The Others, a movie about a house that's too big for one family and how, of course, that means it's fucking haunted. <laughs> and I made Dave watch 1980's The Shining, a documentary about why I'm in therapy now. <laughs> So, this was f- fun. What? Okay, don't come at me looking all <laughs> skeptical and shit. This was a fan-selected episode, right? Yes, it was. We weren't sure what we were going to do for Ghost Horror. We had a couple mm-hmm. matchup options here, and we mm-hmm. took to our Twitch stream to ask the audience, hey, which ones? And they came up with this matchup, The Shining versus The Others. I'm not going to lie. I actually had a lot of fun with these. I did too, yeah. I think they're relatively complimentary films so dave i gotta know why did you pick the others well it was picked for me no i'm kidding uh (laughs) (laughs) i mean basically it was though because you love the shining so much i felt weird being like mine (laughs) so i picked the others uh, out of the two but i don't i'm not sure i've ever even heard of it before this which is a really common theme for some of these movies i thought this was a more popular movie than i guess it actually is i think it was one of those things where like i think because you liked it you're like everybody likes this movie (laughs) well maybe i mean i hear people talking about it on the internet here and there it comes up in film discourse sometimes Uh i haven't seen it since i was a kid and like first came out and nicole kidman i thought was an actual scary victorian lady you know at the time So I didn't watch her movies for a while. It could also be that, you know, I was such a pussy that I didn't like scary movies. (laughs) Oh, I wouldn't call you a pussy to your face. (laughs) I mean, I know that Nicole Kidman was in it and that, uh, of course, her creepy, scary husband, Tom Cruise, was at the time. Anyways, (laughs) one of the scariest things about this movie is Tom Cruise's producing credit. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Because I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, that's weird. But yeah, uh, it was basically one of those like by default situations. So that pretty much leaves you to talk about why you like The Shining. Oh, man. I love The Shining. I mean, it's one of my favorite movies, yes, for sure. I saw this movie way too early in life uh, to be a normal adjusted adult. <laughs> And it is it yeah. has shaped a lot of my viewing habits since then. And uh, it just it just always stuck in my brain. It's so mysterious and so fun. But I have to say, going into this and rediscovering the others, I hadn't seen that since it came out. I wanted to see how these two match up genre-wise. And mm-hmm. as with our other episodes, right. I want to see which is the better ghost horror film, Dave. We're Boo! getting closer to Halloween. We got to narrow this shit down. <laughs> if you're ready to get spooky with it, uh, I think I'm ready. Getting spooky! with it na 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 boo hoo uh. movie one the others 2001 all right dave i need you to give us the synopsis for 2001's the others after a past event that causes the entire staff of servants to walk off the job you know a normal relatable situation a mother stops at nothing to protect her children from voices sheets covered furniture and most importantly sunlight (laughs) (laughs) the scariest villain of all now children are you sitting comfortably then i'll begin So we open to a big-ass old-school mansion surrounded by fog and on-screen text that says Jersey, the Channel Islands, 1945. I just love how whimsically this movie starts. (laughs) It starts so like, hey, children, let me tell you a little story. I'm like, oh, this is cute. I'm excited for these ghosts. I didn't like that at all. Anyway. (coughs) Grace, played by Nicole Kidman, screams herself awake from the naked in the high school cafeteria nightmare, I assume, (laughs) before we cut to the outside of the house and three people walking to the front door and ringing the literal doorbell. 
<laughs> Grace <laughs> lets them in after saying she wasn't expecting them so soon. And we get introduced to the trio. We have Bertha Mills, Lydia, and Mr. Tuttle. That was Tuttle for anybody who didn't like my horrible British accent. Uh, <laughs> I feel like this like giant mansion. It's like if you gave an AI bot, like just said scary old mansion castle, this is the exact image you would come up with. <laughs> yeah. All right. The other girl I had spoke too much anyway. Follow me. So Grace immediately starts showing the trio around and throwing down the gauntlet of rules, which has got to feel like being thrown into the deep end of the pool but like with weights on your ankles <laughs> and instead of water it's jello uh, <laughs> <laughs> we kind of blew past this but these new serpents just show up out of the fucking fog knocking on the door hello <laughs> yeah, there yeah. you need some new servants in your house like okay uh, right. red, red flags but you know fine 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 <laughs> as you can see the housework has been rather neglected since the servants disappeared almost a week ago. So as Grace leads them from room to room, we find out that the previous servants just vanished around a week ago, which I'm sure is nothing to be worried about at all. And that her <laughs> husband went off to war and never came back. This is fine so far. <laughs> <laughs> Have you all noticed what I'm doing? In this house, no door must be opened without the previous one being closed first. It is vital that you remember this. Which is real OCD, not like, oh, I like my sheet straight. OCD. <laughs> also, the children aren't allowed to play on the piano because nobody wants bloody ears. That's a fair restriction. Kids and musical instruments, I was one, I was annoying. Don't let your kids do that. Yeah, agreed. Except for let them because they need to be creative and artistic. Not in my scary mansion. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let's go meet the kids. I'm sure this won't be scary at all. Definitely not. Grace wakes the kids and immediately makes them pray before walking them into the hallway and introducing them to Bertha and Lydia. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do, children? The kids are named Anne and Nicholas, and they have an incurable condition where light threatens their lives, which I believe the scientific term is called being British. The doctors were never able to find a cure. For what? Their condition. So after Grace explains in horrifying detail what would happen to the kids in front of the kids, it's breakfast time because I'm sure they still have their appetites. What did she say happens to the kids, though, if they get exposed to light? I don't know. Something about like a rash. I well, I wasn't sure if it's like poof, they turned into dust. I didn't know if these were vampire <laughs> kids. I didn't know what kind of movie this was. I thought it was a ghost movie. Could be a vampire children movie. I don't know, Dave. Yeah, for a minute there, I was mad at you because I thought this was a ghost movie, and I'm like, oh, it's vampires. Cool. <laughs> Are you going to leave us too? Of course not. The others said they wouldn't, but they did. So Anne asks Bertha if she's going to leave like the others did. And Nicholas is like, girl, shut up. That doesn't stop Anne from telling Bertha that Grace went mad, though. Yeah. Mm, spill that tea. Obviously she went mad. Do you see how this lady walks around? <laughs> like, oh, my God. Like, I've never seen anybody who needs a Xanax prescription more than Grace. <laughs> Mrs. Mills, would you come outside a moment? I'd like a word with you. Grace pulls Bertha, or Mrs. Mills, aside and confronts her because apparently the postman never came to pick up the help wanted ad, which sounds like normal postal service in 2022. <laughs> Some things <laughs> never change, Dave. <laughs> and she wants to know how the trio knew that Grace needed help. And you know what? That's a fair question. Bertha explains this away by being like, girl, look at this big ass house. We just assumed you needed help. Also, you mean you served in a house like this one before? This may come as a surprise to you, ma'am, but we in fact used work here. Convenient. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant scary. <laughs> Listen, Bertha slash Mrs. Mills is sus as fuck. Mr. Tuttle just looks a little sleepy. He just, <laughs> he just needs a little nap. When he saw this, the Roman governor was filled with rage and ordered their heads to be cut off. <laughs> so we cut to a very uncomfortable Bible study where Anne and Nicholas laugh at children having their fucking heads cut off because kids are scary. And Grace low-key threatens them with what would happen in the afterlife if they deny Jesus by making them recite what the four hells are and which one they go to for denying. These kids are going to grow up to found the Westboro Baptist Church. At the center of the earth where it's very, very hot. That's where children go who tell lies, but they don't just go there for a few days. They're damned forever. So now Grace punishes the kids for some reason by making them learn their studies by heart in separate rooms. No, 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 no! Yes, 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 yes. They protest because they're scared. And Nicholas is like, but what about the ghosts? And Grace is like, if you see a ghost, you say hello and continue on studying, which feels like a teacher refusing a bathroom break. <laughs> what if I shit my pants? Well, then you say, oh, and keep going. <laughs> you say, oh, and, and carry your shit around all day. Right. You should not be incontinent at this age. Suddenly, Grace hears crying and goes running to check on Nicholas. And Grace is terrified because a child crying is inherently scary. It's true. What's the matter? Why were you crying? I wasn't Why? crying. I was so then Grace runs to Anne, who also isn't crying. She tells Grace that it was that boy, Victor. I think two creepy kids is enough. Thank you. Can we also talk about how fucking stressful it is already? I'm stressed out just watching her like all these fucking giant keys, keys and she's and trying to open <laughs> doors and shut them. I'm like, bitch, you forgot one. No, go back. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's so stressful. It was that boy, Victor. 
Who's Victor? The boy that was here a moment ago. Anne tells Grace that Victor said they have to leave the house. Would you mind telling me how a boy can get in and out of this room if it's locked? She demands that Anne tell her how a boy can get in and out of the room if it's locked, but <gasps> the door is slightly ajar. See? Too many keys, too many doors. I don't fucking like it. Cut to Grace yelling at Bertha and Lydia about opening and closing doors because she just can't accept that Casper is just perusing around her house. <laughs> Fast forward to Anne Nicholas in bed and that already creepy Anne pretends to be even creepier Victor and touches Nicholas's cheek. <laughs> Or so it seems. Well, so the the curtains keep getting pulled open, right, at night? Yeah. And it's scary. And I'm like, okay, are these ghosts or just ghosts of interior decorators? I don't know, Dave. <laughs> they seem very concerned about the curtains. Overly concerned about the curtains. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. Now Grace has Anne standing in the middle of a room reading more fairy tales, or something from the Bible, I'm not sure. So Grace tells Anne to ask the virgin for forgiveness, and Anne is refusing because she says she didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sus. Can you hear my side eye? Anyway, so Grace <laughs> tries to scare Anne with the story of the hell that kids go to, which is the scariest kind of manipulation, I would say. Children who don't tell the truth end up in limbo. Yes, I agree. <laughs> like, how to fuck up your kids for life 101. Right. But Anne is like, girl, I don't believe you. That's what you you say, but I read the other day that limbo's only for children who haven't been baptized. And I have. Fucking mic drop! Dude, yeah, if Anne grows up to be a lawyer, I want her to be my lawyer, because that was fucking savage. <laughs> savage as shit. <sighs> Mrs. Mills, I've had to put up with the noise of Lydia running around above my head. She's, she's been hurtling backwards and forwards as if there were three of her. So after Bertha asks Grace about Anne's punishment with a side dish of, man, this fog won't fucking go away, Grace tells her to make Lydia stop running around upstairs. But uh-oh, Lydia's outside. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Grace asks an obstinate Anne if she's hearing the noises too. Tell me if there is someone upstairs. There, in that junk room. And then in the creepy ass junk room, literally everything is covered in sheets. And using Anne's logic, it's just a bunch of ghosts hanging out having a swap meet. So <laughs> <laughs> at least they're social ghosts. I mean, geez, <laughs> they got to hang out together sometimes. Right. Grace hears creepy ass breathing and voices saying she's watching us and justifiably freaks the fuck out before she goes running around the house trying to find the voices. All while Anne is saying, They're everywhere. They say this house is theirs. And they say they're going to take the curtains down as well. She's so fucking chill about this oh, it's over there now they ran this way oh they're over there Anne has seen so much shit that she's not even phased by her insanity it's great right. <laughs> this is the father this is the mother this is victor and this is the old woman so now Anne decides to be even creepier by showing grace her terrible drawing <laughs> Dunking on these kids. Go to art school. Okay, so... <laughs> Get a fucking art degree, okay? We have to open all the curtains. I don't want any dark corners where someone could hide. Yes, ma'am. And then Grace makes Bertha and the other two help her search every inch of the house for Germans, apparently. I don't know. And they open every <laughs> curtain as they go. I've seen goldfish learn faster than Grace. <laughs> so, of course, this search for Germans is as fruitless as going apple picking in the desert. But Grace finds a bunch of old photos, including photo albums of people sleeping. Oh, nope, those are dead people. In the last century, I believe they used to take photographs of the dead in the hopes that their souls would go on living through the portraits. That's horrifying. At least make them smile or something. Actually, that's even worse. Scratch that. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> if anyone takes postmortem photos of me, at least put me in some cool sunglasses. All right. <laughs> like, I, I want to at least look cool when I'm dead. Noted. Grace hears the piano playing and grabs a shotgun to shoot the ghost? I don't know. The 40s were wild. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> so when she gets to the piano, there's no one there. And then she gets her ass kicked by the music room door. <laughs> Listen, I'm not saying I've walked into doors or had doors kick my ass, but I have, and it hurts, and I really hurt. <laughs> and now, sitting in the kitchen with Bertha, Grace finally fucking gets it. There is something in this house. Something to Something which is not, not at rest. The door knocks some sense to her, it seems. Sometimes concussions are positive. <laughs> Bertha is supportive, but still creepy as shit somehow. Also, I spoke too soon because Grace fucking 180 is like a bad Fast and Furious stunt. I do believe it, ma'am. The Lord would never allow such an aberration. The living and the dead, they will only meet at the end of eternity. And now she made up her mind to wander off into the fog like someone about to end up on a true crime podcast. Where are you off to, ma'am? 
I'm going to the village to my father look around visit. Grace just straight up wanders off into the, <laughs> the foggy abyss without a compass, without uh, a map or anything. And I'm like, you clearly haven't left this house in, since your kids were born. So right. I don't know. I'm feeling a little nervous, a little upset. And uh, it turns out fine, though, right? We'll get there. But not before she tells Mr. Tuttle to search the grounds for gravestones because... When my husband bought this house, we were told there was a little cemetery. Which would have been a slight deal breaker for me, but I digress. Which also would have been good to fucking know earlier earlier race (laughs) jesus dude so bertha talks with mr tuttle in a weird diabolical way saying the fog won't let grace get very far and then mr tuttle asks when do you think we should bring all this out into the open all in good time mr tuttle all in good time and then bertha points out the top of a gravestone that mr tuttle finishes covering with leaves and at this point, I feel like they're up to something. This is the most like heavy handed ass change of tones ever. <laughs> like this is a really great atmospheric spooky movie mm-hmm. and it's played for realism and stuff. And I really bought into this. Yeah. Grace wanders off into the fucking fog <laughs> and uh, and Mrs. Mills is like, cover the gravestones. Do you think they know? <laughs> and they're like, and I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Then we cut back to Grace walking in the fog that gets thicker than dry nacho cheese, and she obviously gets lost in a little panicky when suddenly... Charles? Grace. It's her fucking husband. He just happens to be coming home from war at the exact same time Grace is losing her mind. Love it. This all makes sense to me and is definitely not a red flag. I, you know, I gotta say, it would be a sweet reunion, but Charles, the husband, goes... Sometimes I bleed. Okay, Chuck. Way to be weird as fuck. It must run in the family. Go talk to your daughter. So the kids are vampires. The husband's a vampire. And Grace is just an under-medicated housewife? <laughs> yes. Do I have this right? Am I on board with this movie so far, Dave? Well, just keep let's going. find just out. Just keep going. <laughs> this is my house. This is my husband. So after getting introduced to Bertha, Charles goes to the kids, and that is the actual sweetest reunion ever. The kids are so happy to see him, and then Anne has to go and ruin it by being fucking creepy and asking if he's killed anyone like she's a future serial killer. (laughs) (laughs) So cut to Bertha and Lydia in Mr. Tuttle's shed, discussing Grace's stubborn ass, when Mr. Tuttle asks, What about her daughter? The children will be easier to convince. Bertha is starting to sound like a fucking cult leader. I got my eye on you, lady. Just saying. So Anne, who is in her first communion dress, is humming and dancing around like a creepy music box. While at the same time, Grace, she goes back to Anne's room to tell her to take off the dress. But uh uh-oh, it's not Anne. It's the scariest old lady I've ever seen. Ah! What's the matter? (laughs) Grace justifiably freaks out and attacks the old lady. But when she rips off the veil, it's Anne again. And Anne is such a prankster. (laughs) (laughs) That little bitch. (laughs) So after Bertha tries to calm Grace, but instead pisses her off because she's got a goddamn hair trigger, Grace is in the bedroom with Charles. And told me everything. First I thought there was someone else in the house. He even thought that there were ghosts. I'm not talking about the ghosts. I'm talking about what happened that day. What day? What happened? <laughs> I want to know. So <laughs> so she tells him that she doesn't know what came over her that day. And at the same time, Anne tells Nicholas that Grace went mad just like she did that day. Oh my God, someone tell me what happened. <laughs> so anyway, Charles tells her that he only came back to say goodbye to his wife and children. Wait. Charles is a ghost. Is Charles a ghost? Ghost Charles. Ghost. <laughs> Char- uh, G- Garls. Look, Ch- Chost Garls. Chost Garls. <laughs> You're not going, do you hear me? You left us once already. You can't go. And after Grace yells at him, accusing him of wanting to leave her, and I can't imagine why, he responds by giving her a good old-fashioned ghost dicking, because goodbyes make people horny, I guess. <laughs> oh... So after Charles's pump and dump, the children wake up in the sunlight. (laughs) That felt really gross. (laughs) Pause while I take a shower. Jesus. Sorry. So after Charles's nut and bolt, uh, the children wake up. (laughs) Do you have a list of these written down? What the fuck? (laughs) Don't find Dave on the dating apps. (laughs) Oh, fuck you. (laughs) It ends badly for everybody. (laughs) So after Charles's sweet love making and adiosing the children wake up in the sunlight gentle i love it (laughs) the children wake up in the sunlight because every single curtain in the entire house has been torn down 
Grace throws her coat over them while she runs around the house looking for a dark place to put them in. She's basically treating them like a child who just pissed the bed and is like trying to hide their sheets. So uh, to confirm here, these are interior decorator ghosts. Like for sure now, <laughs> curtains are gone. The place looks fabulous. Let's be honest here. Where are they? What? The curtains! Anyway, after she gets the kids to hard air quotes safety grace starts screaming at lydia and bertha about the curtains being gone and bertha hits her with some snark that i can only aspire to and she says i have noticed ma'am there's no need for you to raise your voice <laughs> on top of the fucking mic drop bertha is like girl calm down maybe the kids aren't allergic to sunlight anymore like maybe it cleared up like diseases do sometimes <laughs> like i'm not sure how that you know. works but anyway <laughs> you know those incurable uh genetic diseases and mutations sometimes they just go away yeah like a bad rash so <laughs> Ew. You will leave this house! Now Grace goes searching for the curtains after telling the trio they're out of here like a manic baseball umpire, <laughs> and she takes their keys at gunpoint. And as the trio leave the house... You know something, Mr. Tuttle? I think I've reached the end of my tether. What about you? Definitely. We'd better go and uncover the gravestones. I really think they might be up to something. They're protecting the interior decorator ghosts because they <laughs> want a job too, dude. I get it. We all hmm. got to get employed. Well, I don't want to. So, uh, <laughs> moving on. Where are you going? I'm going to the woods to look for daddy. Fast forward to nighttime and the kids decide to escape to go looking for their father like the least prepared detectives ever. <laughs> and after wandering around the yard for a few minutes, the kids stumble upon the aforementioned gravestones. While this is going on, Grace decides to go through the room Bertha and Lydia were using, like a parent looking for weed in their kid's room, and she finds one of those dead people pictures of the trio. <gasps> and at the same time, Anne reads the gravestones, and they belong to the trio, you know, in case the dead people picture didn't make that fucking clear. Annie, let's come here! Why? They're dead! The servants are dead, Dave? <laughs> It would have been cool if they had sunglasses on. I'm just saying, we set a precedent with my postmortem photos. I just want everybody to have sunglasses on. Fair enough. And maybe like a cigarette hanging out of their mouth. Oh, yeah, that is cool. Smoking is fucking cool, for sure. <laughs> Hands down. Smoke, kids. Everybody. I'm here to tell you, listen what I say. Smoking's not cool. Hey, it's not okay. Anyway, the kids sprint back to the house where Grace stands at the top of the steps, pointing her gun at the ghost trio like she's a fucking ghostbuster. <laughs> Don't trouble yourself, man. Tuberculosis finished us off more than half a century ago. And shocker, nothing happens to the ghosts because they're ghosts. You need ghost bullets. <laughs> but weirdly, they can't get through the door that Grace locks in their faces. But hey, you know, at least they're snarky. I was wondering the same fucking thing, dude. Bullets pass through them and they just walk up to the door and knock politely. Hey, can you let <laughs> us in? We just want to be spooky to you. Yeah, and maybe if they didn't walk up to the fucking door like, oh, we're right. ghosts now. <laughs> like Hank Hill. You know. Be more casual about it, dog. And don't start by coming out of the fucking woods. Open the door, ma'am. Please. What do you want? So Grace tells the kids to go hide as Bertha tells her through the door that doesn't block any sounds, apparently, nope. that the living and the dead must learn to live together. She also scares Grace even more by saying, Believe me, sooner or later, they'll find you. Way to be super ominous, you creepy bastards. <laughs> and also vague. Could have gotten to the fucking point. So while in their hiding spot, the kids hear raggedy breathing because one of the intruders was a smoker, I guess. And then, <laughs> Come with us. Come with us. The fucking old lady just appears out of nowhere. Ah. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that I shit myself, but I'm not going to deny it either. The receipt with the Depends line item on it has other tales to tell. Just talk to our accountant. Oh, I did it. So now, Grace is sneaking upstairs towards the sound of her kids whimpering and the old lady chattering away like a mom on a phone call. Why are you afraid to And when she opens the door, the old lady is sitting at a table surrounded by four others. They're clearly having a seance, and Grace and the kids are the fucking ghosts. I knew it. Ah, uh, yeah, I knew it too. <laughs> <laughs> the old lady, well, you've seen it before, you dick. That's the only thing I remember about this movie, <laughs> legitimately. Yeah, that tracks. What happened in this room? What did your mother do to you? The old lady asks the children what their mother did to them. And while Grace looks on in horror, like a kid getting ratted out by their classmate for shitting on the teacher's desk, Anne whispers in the old creepy lady's ear. Something about a pillow. Is that how she killed you? Children, if you're dead, why do you remain in this house? 
now wait a fucking minute what now <laughs> you're coming at me with a lot of fucking questions here lady all right i'm nine and i'm pissed and scared i'm going to hell at every moment so if you could also enlighten me that'd be great right and they react in the only way that they can we're not dead we're not dead we're not dead and now grace runs at the table and shakes it before tearing up the papers on it and then we see what the people around the table see which is all of that happening but no grace so i don't know they seem pretty fucking dead to me <laughs> they made contact Anyway, we get the actually alive people around the table discussing what just happened as if they all have dry underwear. And the wife says that they can't possibly stay in this house any longer because clearly these beings do not want them to live there. And the husband's like, girl, we don't even know them. Yes, we do. We know the woman went mad, smothered her two children, and then shot herself. <clears throat> What? Bro, the husband is so chill about this. He just saw a table rattling in front of his face. He saw papers rip up by a ghost before his eyes. He's like, it's not that bad, though. He's like, yeah, it's fine. Please, let us leave this house. All right. We will leave tomorrow morning. So after the husband agrees finally to leave in the morning, we see Grace holding the kids in the hallway, finally recounting the events of that day. Nothing like realizing you're a fucking ghost to jog your memory. You were playing with the pillows as if nothing had happened. And I thought the Lord and his great mercy was giving me another chance. Girl, I thought you didn't believe in fairy tales. Not to be like a total fucking nihilist, but her existing in like the ghost realm is also kind of the biggest tell that uh. the shit you've been reading uh, isn't holding up in, <laughs> in real world use case scenarios. The intruders are leaving, but others will come. Now sometimes we'll sense them, other times we won't. So now, Bertha is standing in the hallway because apparently they can walk through doors. Thanks for gaslighting me. She tells Grace that the intruders are leaving, but others will come. And sometimes they'll sense them, sometimes they won't. Sounds like a weatherman who lied to get the job. <laughs> After finally admitting that she doesn't actually know shit, she tells the kids that she's always loved them. And this house is ours. This house is ours. This house is ours. This house is ours. I'm so glad to see they fully embrace their lifestyle, which is great timing too, because they stand in the window looking outside and disappearing as the Alive family packs up their car and drives away. A for sale sign on the iron gates. Roll credits. One question, lots of sure. questions actually, but the one I have right now <laughs> is they're like, cool, this is our house. This is always going to be our house. And I kind of read that is we're going to terrorize anybody who comes into this house. <laughs> Bitch, they're going to tear that down so quick and then you live in the garden, okay? Just saying. <laughs> Think about it first. Yeah. I have to say, though, I really love the atmosphere of this film. It feels like a Victorian era ghost story that you tell like late at night or on Halloween. Yeah. I think there's a lot to this movie. It's kind of a one-trick pony in terms of the plot. Everybody's dead. <laughs> They've been dead the whole time. <laughs> but I think this film does have a lot to say about grief and religion and understanding and I, I really actually like this film a lot even though I knew the ending the whole time well I liked it sans religion because for me as as you know as a person I don't think that that's necessary for the film and it kind of I'm not gonna be honest with you it annoyed me quite a bit really yes like quite a bit because it's like come on I mean I see this movie as a repudiation of religion and it, I don't see this as a religious film at all. Well, no, I'm not it saying it was a religious thing. Yeah, I'm not saying it was a religious film. I'm just saying I didn't like the religious things in it. I think the religious things in it, I, I really, really like because it's presenting as this like one-sided fact-based thing. And then it turns it on its head. She's talking about all these amazing, miraculous things that go on in the Bible, but refuses to believe there's ghosts. Right. <laughs> so it, I think the film confronts that. And I think it was really interesting. I, again, I like the movie. I was just annoyed how it started out with prayer. And I'm like, oh, here we go. But, uh let's get past that and why let's... you don't want to talk about religion for like the next 45 minutes i'd rather put my dick through a meat grinder cool let me go get my rosary and we're gonna come <laughs> right back to that point movie two the shining 1980 all right man let's get fucking bloody and creepy and lose our minds so give me the synopsis for the shining Meet Jack Torrance, a man who brings his family up a mountain to work as the winter caretaker of the Overlook Hotel. We'll grab a drink with Lloyd the bartender, hug a rotting corpse, and finally <laughs> learn how to kill our entire families from a clumsy, time-traveling ghost waiter. <laughs> Epic. That was probably the best <laughs> description of this movie. 
So we open to aerial shots of a car driving up a beautiful sunny mountain in Colorado. Mm-hmm. But the music is spooky, Dave. <laughs> this sets the tone and perfectly complements the others. The sun is scary and I don't like it. <laughs> The camera focuses on a hotel resort on top of the mountain. This is the very brown Overlook Hotel. (laughs) (laughs) I don't remember it being brown. That's so weird. It blends in with the environment pretty well. It's camouflage Overlook Hotel. (laughs) Finally, we get a title card that says the interview in walks our main character with the most menacing hairline i think i've ever seen jack (laughs) torrance played by jack nicholson hey jack is playing jack why does that keep happening it's less confusing that way hi i've got an appointment with mr allman my name is jack torrance He's here to interview to be the winter caretaker of the Overlook, which is a great idea if you're cool with high elevation panic attacks. <laughs> and so far, the only scary thing is that Jack had to drive three and a half fucking hours for this interview. <laughs> I know. What the fuck? Telephones were still a thing in 1980, I fucking promise you. Plus, can you imagine if you didn't get the job, though? Oh, and God. And your ass drove up a whole mountain to not get it? Yeah, and then you got to drive all the way the fuck back. <laughs> the 80s were off to a rough start, Dave. Now we cut to an apartment building, not on a desolate mountain, where we meet our other two main characters, Jack's wife, Wendy Torrance, played by Olive Oil, (laughs) and their young son, Danny. I have to squeeze him each night to keep him warm. Does anybody understand Popeye references anymore? (laughs) I don't even think people know what Popeye is these days, but... I'm sorry if you're under 73 years old and you didn't get that joke. Wendy is played by Shelley Duvall. Now, Danny asks Wendy the question that's on everybody's minds. Do you really want to go and live in that hotel for the winter? No, should be the answer, but (laughs) Wendy's cool with it, and Danny finally agrees. You know who is on my side of this, though? Who? Danny's imaginary friend, Tony. Creepy finger! (laughs) I don't want to go there, Mrs. Torrance. Well, how come you don't want to go? I can't. Don't. Also, if your kid starts talking to you like this, please, and I, I mean this from the bottom of my fucking heart, see your local exorcist. Now. <laughs> well, the winners can be fantastically cruel. Back at the Overlook Hotel, Jack, who we learn is a school teacher turned writer, gets the rundown of the place from Ullman. I like how he says, teaching is a way to make ends meet while he writes. But listen, teaching isn't even a way to make ends meet while teaching. <laughs> Exactly. Get a paper route, Jack. Jesus. <laughs> so Mr. Ullman gives him basic dates and duties, but also an ominous warning. The only thing that can get a bit trying up here during the winter is uh, the tremendous sense of isolation. Well, that <clears throat> just happens to be exactly what I'm looking for. Just want to outline my new writing project, <laughs> relax a little bit, murder my entire family, you know, <laughs> what every man wants. Totally. Maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here, yes, Dave, but yeah. Omen does have a minor incidental, really, story about a caretaker named Grady. I don't suppose they uh, told you anything in Denver about the tragedy we had up here during the winter of 1970? Oh, no. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> My predecessor in this job hired a man named Charles Grady as the winter caretaker. He came up here with his wife and two little girls. But at some point during the winter, he must have suffered some kind of a complete mental breakdown. He ran amok and... Uh, Killed his family with an axe. Ullman's pretty chill about this. I mean, he, kill, he just drops it like it's a fucking like, yeah, you know, he just tripped the foot on the stairs. Right. And then, <laughs> right. And then Jack is just like, that is uh, quite a story. You can rest assured, Mr. Ullman, that's not going to happen with me. He doesn't really even blink at it. No. I also kind of wonder if they give a discount to, like, the rooms that people were murdered in in this hotel. <laughs> but also, it's not fine, Jack. None of this is fine. But also, I'm looking for a deal on hotel rooms. So... <laughs> Tony, do you think Dad will get the job? He already did. We're back at the apartment now, and Danny is in the bathroom talking to our friend Tony again. Creepy fingers back. Tony, why don't you want to go to the hotel? I don't know. You do too, no. Now come on, tell me. Since Danny asked nicely, Tony decides to give him a vision (laughs) of the elevator doors at the Overlook. Blood pours out of them. All right, just because Tony caught the Overlook on a heavy flow day doesn't mean it's all bad, (laughs) Dave. Don't judge a hotel by its blood volume, is what I always say. (laughs) Actually, I think that's the best way to judge a hotel. (laughs) Now hold your eyes still so I can see. 
So Danny wakes up from his vision to a doctor asking him questions. He had a seizure, but the doctor chalks it up to, like, kids be crazy sometimes. <laughs> I would just ignore those seizures and they'll probably go away. Mrs. Torrance, I don't think you have anything to worry about. <laughs> I think this doctor is actually one of the ghosts from the others. Probably. Did you check the kids to make sure they still have a genetic disease? <laughs> I'm just glad I grew up in the 90s when they just gave us lots and lots of pills. <laughs> I drool a lot now, but I'm cool with it. What sort of injury did he have? Uh, he dislocated his shoulder. How did he manage to do that? So the doctor talks to Wendy, who's dressed like a fairy tale housewife. <laughs> she talks about Jack's semi-violent history with Danny. He came home drunk one time, grabbed him too hard, and dislocated his shoulder. It's just the sort of thing you do a hundred times with a child, you know. No, it's not, Wendy. <laughs> no, it's fucking not, Wendy. Also, I don't want to be mean, but I just can't take my eyes off her teeth, man. You know what I can't take my eyes off of? Huh? The two-foot-long ash on her cigarette. <laughs> It's giving me nervous tics, Dave. Everything about this scene is fucking uncomfortable. <laughs> So if you weren't paying attention up to this point, Jack is a five month sober writer, fully comfortable with murder hotels, loves long desolate drives and dislocating his son's arm. That's a dating profile if I ever heard one. <laughs> Felt like they ripped mine off, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the Torrance family drive up the winding mountain pass without seatbelts on and arrive at the Overlook. Everyone is leaving for the winter, but also because they know this place is fucking haunted for sure. Right. <laughs> In view of all the ground we have to cover today, I suggest we go have a quick look at your apartment and then get started straight away. So Jack and Wendy get the grand tour, and Danny throws darts in the game room. He's visited by two little girls holding hands in bright blue dresses, looking like they just left the saddest Easter egg hunt of all time. <laughs> They're spooky, but to be fair, this is also the same music that plays in my head every time I see any little kids, so yeah. jury's still out, Dave. Because kids are scary. This is Dick Halloran, our head chef. Torrance's are going to take care of the Overlook for us this winter. Oh, that's just great. Now we get to meet the head chef of the Overlook, Dick Halloran, played by Scatman Carruthers. Yeah. Halloran gives Wendy and Danny the tour of the kitchen and casually talks into Danny's brain. Ha ha ha! Yeah, you know, telepathy? No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> Overlook has a telepathic chef who loves himself some Rocky Road. What kind of ice cream do you like, Doc? Chocolate. Alone together, Halloran tells Danny that they both have something he calls a shining. Right. He and Danny both shine, which is like the happiest sounding interpretation of superpowers I think I've ever heard. <laughs> Danny asks Halloran if he's scared of the Overlook, and Halloran says, No. You know, some places are like people. Some shine and some don't. I guess you could say the Overlook Hotel here has something about it that's like shining. Well, that's <laughs> officially four on my spooky bingo card. <laughs> we got sad Easter girls. We got telepathic murder hotel, bloody tragedy, <laughs> and boring car rides. <laughs> All I need to win is rotting bathtub corpse, and I might sail off in the sunset here. We're getting there. Is there something bad here? You know, Doc, when something happens, it can leave a trace of itself behind. Let me stop you right there, dick. The word you're looking for is yes. <laughs> but also stay out of room 237. That's just guaranteeing that Danny goes into room 237. Have you ever met any child ever? <laughs> it's very baity. He should have been like, oh, you have to check out room 237. It's full of encyclopedias and maps <laughs> and things that are boring to kids. And Do you like vocabulary homework? Danny would have never even dreamt of going in there. <laughs> Good morning, hon. <laughs> Now we jump forward a month in time. Jack is struggling creatively to come up with a book idea, but Wendy and Danny seem to be having a fucking blast, Dave. Yeah. They go for a walk in a magic hedge maze, and I only call it that because this hedge maze is not in any of the establishing hotel shots at all. <laughs> Where did it come from? So as time goes by, we learn that a major snowstorm is approaching. Sunny, it's so beautiful here in Denver today, it's hard to believe a snowstorm could be that close. Jack meanders about the hotel, which is exactly what I do when I can't write, but scaled down to like a 400 square foot sad apartment. <laughs> I'm doing okay. <laughs> Hold to check in on Blake. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Hold for wellness check. Hi, hon. How's it going? 
So Jack isn't having a good time. (laughs) There's just something about Jack Nicholson that's just scary. And the tension is piling up in this claustrophobia-inducing giant hotel, and Jack just needs some peace and quiet. I'm not being grouchy. I just want to finish my work. Jesus, Dave, it's like looking in a fucking mirror. (laughs) Mm, Can neither confirm nor nor deny. (laughs) And we're going to make a new rule. Whether I'm in here and you hear me typing, whether you don't hear me typing, what the fuck you hear me doing in here when I'm in here, that means that I am working. That means don't come in. Okay though to be fair jack you're not even in a room he's like in the main hotel common area right it's like living in a house and telling everybody they can't use the hallways it's if you see me in the house don't come in the house if you're in the house and you see me in the house don't be in the house i think the words you're looking for are i want a divorce i know you've got So the snow has come, the phone lines are down, and it's pretty clear that Jack is hanging on to his sanity by a thread. He stares out the window with a pure dissociative grin, kind of like how I stare at the donuts in a Krispy Kreme. (laughs) (laughs) Meanwhile, Danny rides his big wheel around the hotel. He turns a corner and sees... Come and play with us, Danny. Nope. Forever. Nope. And ever. Nope. And ever. Nope. It's the Easter twins, and they're trying to recruit Danny to find the rest of the eggs they missed. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> it cuts quickly between the girls and images of them, like, hacked up with an axe. Ooh. Like, I think I mentioned this. I saw this movie when I was, like, nine, and it <laughs> fucked me up for a long, long time. It's really disturbing. <laughs> So much like myself, Danny freaks out, but Tony consoles him. It's just like pictures in a book, Danny. It isn't real. Thanks, Tony. Now I kind of want a talking finger to console (laughs) me when I'm scared. (laughs) Creepy finger! Don't be scared, Blake. This podcast isn't real. Dave (laughs) isn't real. You're in a coma. A few days later, Danny is playing with his toy cars when a ball rolls up to him from nowhere. So Danny goes down the hallway where the door for room 237 is open. What did we just talk about? Like, I saw that and I was like, no, force quit. Force quit this hotel. (laughs) (laughs) Just pull the plug out of the wall. End this. Mom, are you in there? Don't say I didn't warn you, Danny. Jesus Christ. Anyway, we cut to Wendy, who hears Jack screaming. She rushes to wake him up from a nightmare at his writing desk. I have those all the time, but I'm usually awake and just looking at my writing. <laughs> yeah. So Jack tells her what his nightmare was all about. I dreamed that I, that I killed you with Danny. <laughs> but I didn't just kill you. <laughs> I cut you up in little pieces. Wendy... Honey, this is another one of those red flags you've been ignoring. I'm going to need you to take another look. It's time to get the fuck out of here, Wendy. Okay? (laughs) All in due time, Dave. Because while Jack recovers from his nightmare, Danny comes into the room all scratched up, and he's not talking. He's, like, sucking his thumb. He looks all fucked up. Right. So Wendy comes to the obvious Jack-sized conclusion and starts accusing her husband. (laughs) You son of a bitch! You did this! Jack is not having it. He's pretty pissed at the accusation because he obviously wouldn't hurt anybody, you know, considering his really super stable behavior. He (laughs) storms off into the ballroom and heads to the bar to meet the best goddamn bartender in the spirit realm, Lloyd. A little slow tonight, isn't it? Yes, it is, Mr. Torrance. What let be? I like how he, at this point, is walking like a cracked out homeless guy. So like Jack Nicholson. What did I say? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> jack's ready to leap off the wagon headfirst into some ghost bourbon here's to five miserable months on the wagon and all the irreparable harm that it's caused me so after complaining about his family to lloyd wendy comes running in with a baseball bat there's someone else in the hotel with us there's a crazy woman in one of the rooms she tried to strangle danny Are you out of your fucking mind <laughs> 
Dude, the fear in the quote unquote sperm bank, as <laughs> Jack puts it, as he calls Jack it the old sperm bank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the panic in her face, unreal. Her terror is terrifying. Wait. Mm hmm. <laughs> Now we cut to an even scarier place than a haunted hotel, Florida. <laughs> Florida man says, Holleran is kicking it in his condo in Florida when he receives a mental telegram from Danny in Colorado. <laughs> Something is wrong, and he has to get a hold of the non-telepathic Torrance's ASAP. We then cut back to the hotel where Jack is investigating room 237. He opens the bathroom door to find a naked woman in the bathtub. She's just a normal, naked hotel lady who wants to give Jack a hug. And Jack, he obliges all too lustfully. I have to say, I have never been less excited to see titties in my life. <laughs> <laughs> So Jack is smooching on this lady, but when he's done, the naked hotel lady isn't looking so hot anymore. <laughs> That's right, she's a floating bathtub corpse and I just won spooky bingo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll take my free Subway sandwich now. <laughs> also, the decaying old lady titties? Where's the off-ramp for this movie? Dude, it is non-fucking-stop. This is one of the freakiest scenes, and not just because she's naked and old, just the way it's shot, the way... Oh, that's the only, that's the only reason I was scared. Sorry, go on. <laughs> <laughs> the music and every... It's, it's, it's freaky, man, and the makeup here is really, really good, too. I didn't see one goddamn thing. So Jack is out of there and he meets up with Wendy again and gaslights her while Danny has some more horrific visions in bed. I think he did it to himself. Regardless of this, Wendy is a good mom and she poses a great idea. Whatever the explanation is, I think we have to get Danny out of here. Jack is not into this idea. He thinks Wendy's just sabotaging him. Wendy, I have let you fuck up my life so far, but I am not gonna let you fuck this up. Jack Torrance, everybody. My God. Savage in the streets, savage in the sheets. How does that sing go? <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Torrance. Good evening. Now Jack walks into the ballroom because he's pissed again, and he finds a whole ass Art Deco party going on. Ghost party! Although I gotta say, this is the kind of party that I don't want to be invited to. <laughs> this is spooky. I want to be invited to this party, actually. It looks, it looks pretty cool. Uh, I don't know. So Jack chats with the bartender, spirit tender Lloyd. I don't know. He has a drink, but gets spilled on by a waiter who cleans him up in the bathroom. What do they call you around here, Jeezy? Grady, sir. Delbert Grady. Now, if you recall your Shining Lord, Dave, Delbert Grady was the name of the guy who chopped up his Easter daughters and wife ten years ago. Oh, yeah. Mr. Grady, you were the caretaker here. You, uh, chopped your wife and daughter up into little bits, and you blew your brains out. Pretty presumptuous, considering we've time-traveled 60 years ago, but <laughs> either way, Grady has a pretty chilling rebuttal. But you are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. I should know, sir. I've always been here. Fucking what? What? I was fine with Haunted Hotel, Dave, but I'm less fine with time-traveling telepathic eternal ghosts. <laughs> And luckily for me, Grady isn't done yet. I'm pretty sure he got his degree in family psychology because he gives Jack some hella good tips. Your son is a very great talent, but he is attempting to use that very talent against your will. It's his mother. She uh, interferes. Perhaps they need a good talking to. Perhaps a bit more. Basically, the ghost told on Danny for contacting Halloran. I'm sure this will turn out just fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Jack has to act now. The first thing he does, kill the radio. <laughs> now, they're really fucking isolated. This is KDK1, calling KDK12. Are you receiving... Now, called to action himself, Dick Halloran flies across the country overnight, and despite the immense snow, he's going to get up to the Overlook Hotel. And I've seen this movie like a hundred times, but I can't tell if Halloran is really concerned for the family, or if he's really just trying to get the fuck out of Florida. <laughs> I don't blame him either way. I'm going to say the Florida thing. <laughs> It's the next day, and Wendy goes looking for Jack with her trusty friend, Ashy the baseball bat. <laughs> you get it? It's a wood joke. I did a wood oh. joke. 
Anyway, she does not find Jack. <laughs> she finds his writing, though, and it sucks. <laughs> Written on all of the paper is a bunch of haikus about Jack's best friend, Lloyd, the bartender. What? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, maybe I want them to be cute little haikus about him and his homoerotic relationship with Lloyd, but in reality, it's just a repeat of the same phrase over and over again. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. This man has gotten nothing done. He's losing it, man. I I didn't really think he had it to begin with, but anyway. That actually is a very good point. He was shaky to start. Yeah. Speaking of Jack, he finally shows back up. How do you like it? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. He approaches Wendy asking what she thinks they should do with Danny. He's a sick boy, after all. Yeah, sure. I think we should discuss Danny. I think we should discuss what should be done. Things start to get a little tense, so Wendy backs up the stairs with her baseball bat. I just need a chance to think things over. You've had your whole fucking life to think things over. What good's a few minutes more gonna do you now? Wendy starts swinging at him with a baseball bat like a pinata at a five-year-old's birthday party, (laughs) and it's just not working. I said, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Finally, Wendy channels her inner Mike Trout and cracks Jack in the head. (laughs) Now that Wendy's found her inner and outer strength, she drags Jack's comatose body into the storage room and decides to get the fuck out of the overlook with Danny. But the radio wasn't the only thing Jack sabotaged. I mean... He also killed the snowmobile this motherfucker sabotaged everything they could possibly use i literally can't do anything because he destroyed it all (laughs) so (laughs) fuck and wendy and danny are officially stuck at the overlook hotel great Lots of stuff is going on now, Dave. The time-traveling, semi-corporeal ghost of Grady lets Jack out of the storage room as Halloran makes his way up the mountain in a snowmobile. Right. Upstairs, Wendy fell asleep somehow, but Danny slash Tony is here to wake her ass up in the worst possible way. Red rum. Red rum. He picks up a knife from Wendy's bedside table, grabs some lipstick, and writes the word red rum on the door. Red rum! Red rum! Stop it! Red rum! I mean, can you imagine waking up to a child holding a knife saying red rum, seeing that they've written in fucking lipstick on the door? First thing I'm saying is, whose fucking kid is this (laughs) the first thing i'm saying is red rum shit pour me a glass (laughs) so wendy hugs on to danny and looks in the mirror and holy shit red rum is murder spelled backwards this is bad you didn't know that or i'm stupid dave (laughs) even the way danny writes is fucking creepy honestly i love how they show him writing it yeah so because that makes it even creepier to be honest with you (sighs) oh Out in the hall, Jack found an axe and a bunch of one-liners, and you better believe he's coming through that door for them. Wendy, I'm home. (laughs) Wendy shoves Danny out of a window into the snow, but she's too big to get through. She has to stay, and unfortunately, she's brought a knife to an axe party. Here's Johnny! Those great one-liners only get you so far, though, Dave. Jack reaches in to open the door, but Wendy hacks at his hand with the knife, causing him to recoil. But she's like, by the way, I feel like all Wendy had to do to get out of this was just open the window one more inch. (laughs) It's it's a snowy, (laughs) wintry day, Dave. Her arms are only so big. I don't know. I got excuses for Wendy. So Jack hears something outside. It's Halloran's snowmobile. He's finally here to save everybody. Hello? Halloran wanders around the Overlook, calling out for the Torrances, when Ah! Jack pops out like he's at a surprise party where the gift is death, and (laughs) Halloran takes an axe to the chest. He's dead now. Rip. Next time, though, maybe don't wander into the murder hotel calling out like you're selling Girl Scout cookies. You already got the fucking mental telegram. Why are you... Why are you just walking? Hi! (laughs) Like, come on, man. Use some tact in the next life. (laughs) Things are officially going off the rails now after Jack hears Danny scream inside the hotel. Danny! 
Wendy runs through the hotel looking for Danny when she encounters a few spooky things of her own. A dick-sucking man in a dog suit, some <laughs> Halloween store skeletons, and Halloran's dead body. I mean, what in the furry fucking hell? <laughs> While Wendy works her way through the Halloween Express store, Jack chases <laughs> Danny outside into the snowy hedge maze. Danny! I'm coming down! Jack follows Danny's footprints in the snow, but Danny ain't no dumb dumb. He retraces his steps, and Jack, drunk on all that ghost energy, gets <laughs> lost. He wanders around the maze while Danny escapes. Outside of the maze, Wendy and Danny disappear down the mountain in Halloran's snowmobile while Jack wanders around until the next day when Jack's turned into a crazy-eyed human popsicle. Yeah, he's a Jacksicle. <laughs> a Jacksicle. <laughs> Now, back inside the hotel, we see a long dolly shot creeping closer and closer to a wall of photographs. We finally get close enough to see a picture of people that reads, Overlook Hotel, July 4th Ball, 1921. As we get even closer, we recognize the man standing in front. It's Jack. <laughs> Roll credits. I mean, Jack was a ghost the whole time. How did he have a kid? Here's the thing. It doesn't mean he's a ghost the whole time. It could mean a lot of things. I have my theories about it. But the ending of this movie is a prime example of why it's still so intriguing after all these years. Uh -huh. It leaves you thinking about the entire movie all over again. It's like a last little ha-ha. It's, <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so good. You're absolutely a thousand percent right. I just, I couldn't stop thinking about how powerful a ghost spur must be <laughs> <laughs> transcends time and uh human flesh for sure yeah. and like is danny half dead <laughs> <laughs> you just have to make sure you are born of the ghost semen and <laughs> you'll get superpowers yeah and can telecommunicate with chef retirees in florida sure. it's how it all works totally the entire thing that makes this movie so great i think is the pace along with the intense imagery and stuff oh it's so good honestly the fucking random spurts of creepy and blood and i'm just like whoa oh, fucking whoa yeah they're chilling dude some of that imagery i will never forget the first time i saw that i knew the creepy girls were coming i knew that was definitely prefaced by danny's bad juju mobile yeah <laughs> <laughs> I definitely hadn't seen this movie all the way through, but I knew almost all the references. I didn't know about the ghost titties, though. <laughs> surprise riding ghost titties aside i think both <laughs> these movies are scary and i think we should just go ahead and battle them um we're doing it <laughs> movie versus movie welcome to the thunderdome the thunderdome <laughs> fucking rules all right, Dave, we're back in the Thunderdome. I'm craving Thunderdome! some ghost bourbon, but maybe after we record. Yeah, please. I need some ghost bourbon. <laughs> So before we watch these movies, Dave, you and I decide on five things that we both agree make a good mm -hmm. genre movie, right? In this case, ghost horror. So let's go through them. Absolutely. Number one, we need informative history. Does the back then affect the right now? Wait, what? Number two, we need extreme isolation. Are we lonely as hell out here? Number three, is there a bone chilling ghost presence? Are you going to be seeing and hearing shit all night? Number four, we need an all-encompassing descent into madness. Is everything spiraling now? And number five, we need a perspective-changing conclusion. Oh shit, what a twist! So, I don't know how you want to divvy this up. Um, would you like to go first? There's a lot of history in your period piece. Yeah, because I didn't really talk too much about it. So... <laughs> <laughs> So the history of The Others is informative in the sense that everything that we go through with the characters is a direct result of the history. Mm -hmm. It's practically a continuation of it. And Grace is basically reliving the past in the present. And because of what happened in the past and how it changed Grace, all of her actions are now a direct result of it. I get that. I feel like the history comes into play a little bit later. I don't know if they're directly related specifically, but the history did give us ghost servants. So I guess that's cool. <laughs> But also a little depressing to know if, like, I died as a custodian in a high school, I'd have to be cleaning up everybody's vomit for the next 200 fucking years. Yeah, that's how it works. You haunt the last job you have. That sucks. <laughs> Capitalism blows, dog. <laughs> but for my case, The Shining, I think, is the perfect example of a film with informative history. It's not shoved in your face, but kind of presented as the story moves along. Uh -huh. We have what Ullman tells us in the beginning, right? But then we're actually shown all the fucked up stuff and more. 
Jack's world gets smaller and smaller, but the history of the hotel expands the world for the audience and kind of makes it feel larger than the tsunami of blood coming down its elevators. <laughs> I think it's really intriguing. I think both are hard. It felt like it was kind of like, hey, here's the history. Wink. I understand. And he, there was some stuff we didn't talk about it, but they're like, oh, this was built on Indian burial ground and like all these things. So Ullman tells us these historical things. Mm -hmm. But I think what is cool is that when we actually see them, we get more depth onto what actually happened. Totally. And speaking of extremes, which I brought up immediately because I'm good at this segue, we're talking extreme <laughs> isolation. And The Shining has that in spades. The family yeah. is in an empty hotel at the top of a mountain in a winter storm without any means of communication other than Danny's spooky brain, you know? <laughs> and the thing that makes this all so scary is that it isn't like this at first. The Torrance has become more and more isolated as the film goes on and things continue to happen mm -hmm. until Jack himself turns into a drunk lumberjack and destroys the radio and their only vehicle out. Yeah, I can't really argue against the Hotel Overlook being fucking isolated, but what I can do is mm -hmm. argue that the spooky mansion in the others is way more isolated because Grace and her family are not only isolated within their own house, the house itself is isolated from literally everything else. Not to mention, they're isolated in this weird foggy purgatory realm or fogatory where <laughs> they're here but not actually sort of like you know that phrase when you hear your family it's like when you're here you're dead <laughs> <laughs> in the context of the setup of the others this is an isolated place but i don't find it as extremely isolating necessarily as the shining but i have to say they're to... in another realm well eventually we find that out <laughs> but <laughs> But in terms of the actual setup of the story, the family is actually really isolated there because Grace can't leave the children. Yeah. She has to have servants do things and she has to rely on the fucking mail service, which obviously <laughs> is not doing its job. Yeah, so because it does it ever. It is isolating. They don't have electricity or anything. So hmm. fair points to that. Speaking of fair points, I'm going to make another one with bone chilling ghost presence. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so every time we hear a voice or a noise coming from someone other than the family and the help, it's extremely creepy because there's supposed to be alone yeah plus seeing the old lady in that dress is holy shit level scary <laughs> and all of that is before we find out that the trio are ghosts themselves which i mean come on they even act creepy at that point <laughs> but then the icing on the metaphorical ghost cake is that every one of the main characters are ghosts themselves and that's the most bone chilling thing in this movie even if i saw it coming from halfway through the first act ghosts on ghosts on ghosts on ghosts <laughs> and like don't hate me for this but the shining is a shining example of how to give oh. your audience a ghost i did it. Womp, Fuck you, womp. Dave. <laughs> But it's not just one thing. I mean, you're dealing with the ghosts of anyone who's died at or been attached to the Overlook. The Torrances, going in with a limited idea of what its past is, it means that something could be around every corner, in every room, or even plying you with ghost booze to convince you to murder your family. You don't know what's going to happen there, Dave. It's a toss-up. The ghostly things happening in this movie give us some of the most iconic horror imagery that is still referenced today. I brought this up at the end of the movie. This movie has a lot of staying power in the ghost presence is strictly behind that yeah i there's not really i have to agree with you i can't really argue that it's an iconic movie for a reason and everything you just listed is the reason it's insanity and speaking of insanity <laughs> we're talking about the all-encompassing descent into madness Jack's impending madness just swallows this family whole. He's already had a tentative grip on things, you know, before. <laughs> but as he drifts, like, further and further from his sanity, Jack's behavior also colors everyone else's experiences here. Yeah. Wendy becomes more on edge and reserved. Danny sees more dead people, and the hotel starts shitting out ghosts <laughs> like they're going out of style, dude. Like, things just go off the rails, and by the time Jack is stalking around screaming classic one-liners, we're in way too fucking deep to come out whole on the other side of this. Yeah, that. listen, this is another thing that I cannot argue against you, because it's basically the main thing in this movie is him going insane. Yeah, Danny and Wendy are never going to be the same. No. Neither's Dick, because he's dead. Oh, but, I liked Dick. Fucking, hold on. I like Dick so much. I love Dick. Wait, I, I like Mr. Halloran as a shining example. 
role there of we go. a great human. Exactly. So instead of trying to argue against all that, I'll just try and argue for the others. Mm -hmm. And I would say that it has a pretty good descent into madness. Yeah. Because as Grace descends into her madness, it's affecting her children in a severe way. They have to deal with the trauma of watching her lose her mind for the second time, we find out. And <laughs> yeah. it also affects the trio, but like they're more annoyed than anything because they had to fucking spell it out for her. <laughs> and I can also can't tell if Anne was creepy before the descent into madness or if she was pushed into creepiness by grace losing her mind i think Anne's always been creepy <laughs> you're right i mean grace's descent into madness it's scary because it's more domestic yes like your mom could lose her mind and snuff you out in your sleep dave you never know Teresa would never do that i love you Teresa. but <laughs> it hits home emotionally even though i knew that they were already dead it was still creepy it didn't change my perspective speaking of perspectives <laughs> let's get the perspective changing conclusion we're crushing the segues today. I just got to <laughs> hand it to us. We're awesome. So the twist or perspective changing conclusion in the others is huge. Doesn't matter. They already knew what it was. Not only does it make all of their experiences make sense. It also explains the fog, which is like, duh, why mm -hmm. Grace is so protective of her children and why the trio are so fucking creepy. And the fact that the, <laughs> the fact that the main characters turn out to be ghosts changes the entire story. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you, uh, but I think I said this earlier. It is kind of like a one trick pony in terms of the plot there's not too much more to dive into it's like here's the answer they're all ghosts this is why this is all happening and so there's not too much more to dive into mystery wise when you re-watch this movie uh -huh. for me i absolutely love the ending of the shining because it's so perfectly eerie and ambiguous that you immediately want to watch the movie again yeah. the ending is the icing on the cake we have our immediate plot resolution right of jack dying and wendy and danny escaping rip halloran but then <laughs> we're left to decipher all these different ghosts Jack's history with the hotel or, or even the hotel's origins it works on uh -huh. so many levels and it gives me chills every single time yeah the thing with him being a ghost at the end got me well and that's the thing I don't think he's a ghost I think it's just his spirit spirit has been drawn to the overlook hotel because it's almost like the hotel has possessed him and that's the thing there's no definitive answers here this conversation is exactly why i think this ending is so fucking good because you can come up with your own ideas and debate it endlessly there's no right answers but there's definitely a wrong answer <laughs> and that wrong answer is that jack is a ghost the whole time I disagree. So let's just go. <laughs> let's not ruin this mostly agreeable Thunderdome and just hop right into the finish line. I think we could do it. Let's do it. Hey, look, we did it. It's the finish line. We're at the finish line. Can I go home yet? Uh, all right. Well, Dave, we have come to the conclusion of our ghost horror episode. We're here at the finish line, ready to breeze through it and uh, figure out a winner. <laughs> well, usually one of us goes first, right? And right. tells the other why they're wrong or right. Who knows? Even if you agree with me, I want to tell you why you're wrong. Yeah, 100%. But this time, I, I have to be honest with you. I have to be honest with you. I think there's only one answer. So I think we should just on three just say the, the winner. Okay. Okay. You ready? Yeah. One, two, three. The, the others. Shine. Wait, what did you say? I'm sorry. The others? I Are you joking? love this movie. Please tell me you're fucking joking. I am 50, 100 million percent joking. There's no fucking way oh, that The Others is going to win over The Shining. My it's, butthole puckered so goddamn hard. I'm a wild card this season, but um, <laughs> The Others is a really great film. Yeah, I agree. You can get lost with the triteness, I guess, of the ending of the, well, everybody was ghosts. But I think there is still a lot of emotional, great stuff to get into and a lot of mm -hmm. cool thematic themes. I think it's worth watching, especially around Halloween time. It's really cool, but The Shining is just the fucking best. It's so good. It's so, I mean, whatever. Go back five minutes ago and listen to all the things I just said. <laughs> that's, that's what I think. I... Agree. I mean, did I make you a fan of The Shining? Are you a fan now? Is this something you would rewatch? Uh, listen, you didn't do anything. The movie did. So I'm taking all the credit. Absolutely um, not. I this is what we're gonna brought fight. this movie into your life. We're going to fight into the, your, into the street. I just want to bond with you, Dave. We already bond too much. Okay. Oh, that's we... true. It's kind of a problem. Our friends are worried. <laughs> Our three-hour daily phone calls 
<laughs> it's, it's starting to get weird after 10 years. Uh, <laughs> real question, are you going to watch this movie ever again? Probably, yeah. I would love to have like a movie night watching this with some peeps. Yeah. It definitely wins first prize, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So Our official winner for the episode, if you weren't sure and are really dumb, <laughs> is The Shining. It's our first prize film. Yeah. We're going to figure out how the ghost realm works get ourselves some grilled cheeses <laughs> and hopefully not condemn ourselves to eternal damnation. Doubtful. See you in hell. <laughs> hey, first prize listeners. Thanks for tuning in this week. Thanks for hunting ghosts with us. If you enjoyed this episode, if you enjoyed hearing us develop nightmares in real time, consider subscribing to our socials. It's at first prize pod on all platforms. And that includes Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're on TikTok and YouTube as well. Also, don't forget to check out our website. It's firstpricefilms.com. We do this for free because we'll all be rotting bathtub corpses one day. But <laughs> if you'd like to support us, consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or come hang out on Twitch. We stream every week talking about movies, having some laughs, and chatting with all of you. Yeah, join us next week as we bring monsters to life in our Halloween episode with these universal monster movies. Ooh, yes, Dave. We're getting old <laughs> and spooky in here. We're talking about The Wolfman, 1941 versus Frankenstein. 1931. Old and spooky in here is the name of my debut album. (laughs) (laughs) See ya! Bye ya! You asshole. I didn't expect you to keep going. I expected you to stop. So I'm like, uh-oh. I'm going to be laughing at this whole goddamn opening. That's great. That's great. Hey, I'm Blake. <laughs> Sorry.